The Marvel Cinematic Universe is my all-time favorite franchise. It means the world to me. I grew up watching these movies, and I've seen them more than anything else, so trying to rank all 50 projects definitively is an impossible task. I've tried doing it over the years, and it changes day by day depending on what mood I'm in, but today, I've done it. I've got them all laid out. We're going to go through them one by one as I rank them from worst to best. Now, a quick disclaimer, I do not think any of these movies are bad. I think the worst Marvel movie is just okay. They've not done anything egregious or bad that I am actively outraged by, and the worst thing they've done is just fine. There are some projects I wish I could have fit in there, like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Cloak and Dagger, and The Runaways. They're some of my all-time favorite shows, but unfortunately, they haven't been confirmed as MCU canon yet, like the Netflix shows just did, so those will be in there, but those ABC shows will not. And I just want to say, before we get started, I am so thankful for 1,000 subscribers. Thank you all for the overwhelming support over the last month and a half. I just wanted to do this as a hobby. I've always been passionate about Marvel and DC, and I wanted an outlet where I can talk about these things, and now I finally do in this YouTube channel. I've been shocked at how fast it's been growing. I really thought nobody would be watching me for years, so to see these videos get thousands of views, it means the world to me, and I hope you'll stick along for this ride. I've got a lot of stuff planned, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So here we go. For my 1,000th subscriber special, this is the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe from worst to best. Okay, starting out at number 50, someone's gonna be at the bottom, and in this case, I think it's the Incredible Hulk. I don't really think this is a surprise for most people. I know it's not really talked about as one of the better films in the MCU, but I just have never really been a fan. I like the idea of a Hulk on the run, and Bruce trying to stop himself from turning into the Hulk, and there are some good scenes like the Harlem fight, but I just can never really get myself into it, and I think it's at the bottom. It really feels like the black sheep of the MCU, where we just kind of don't really talk about it because they were still trying to find their footing. And compared to everything else on here, I just think it's, it's okay. It's fine. I think I've maybe seen this three times in total. Don't really find myself going back to rewatch it a lot. So yeah, at the bottom. I don't think that's going to change unless Marvel really makes a mistake in the coming future. Number 49, we have Thor The Dark World, which again, not a surprise. A lot of people like to think this is one of the worst ones. It's pretty disappointing of a movie. It's not very exciting. It's completely carried by Tom Hiddleston, who does an amazing job. And I would never say it's a bad movie. No movie where Thor hangs Mjolnir on a coat rack can be bad. It's just severely underwhelming. And the only good parts are really Thor and Loki's relationship. Malekith is an incredibly disappointing villain. They make the reality stone an angry sludge for some reason. It's just a very uneventful movie, and we don't talk about it much for a reason. See, so yeah, I don't really think this is changing either. It's it's gonna be here for a while. I rewatched it a few years ago in anticipation for Love and Thunder, and I liked it a little more, but I think it's just another movie that's okay at best. It's nothing special. Number 48, Iron Man 2. Another really early one, and the first really big disappointment from Marvel Studios. Iron Man was so beloved and really kicked off the entire universe, and then for Iron Man 2 to come out and the studio was still trying to find their footing, figure out what's going on, and they just turned it into a bunch of setup for the Avengers, which paid off down the line, but it really hurt this movie. Black Widow's introduction is great. She's a really big star of the movie. Nick Fury is fun, but not letting them tell the true demon in a bottle story really hurts the movie. Being stuck with this movie that kind of half commits to the premise, and Tony's addiction this time is with his suit. It's an interesting idea, but it just doesn't work in execution and it's disappointing Don Cheadle's greatest war machine Mickey Rourke is there as Whiplash and is bored yeah it's just a movie I can never really get into despite having the best Iron Man suit up sequence it's always going to be towards the bottom number 47 Secret Invasion. We all knew this one was going to be low. Secret Invasion was probably the most disappointed I've ever been as a Marvel fan, for the MCU at least. There is so much anticipation and hype for this show. It could have been a game changer. It should have been a game changer, but then the finale happened, and we all just kind of groaned and forgot the show existed. We should have known from that AI intro at the beginning that it was going to be a mess. I really liked the first four episodes of Secret Invasion. I think they were pretty strong. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of them killing off Maria Hill and not really mentioning her after that, but they set up a really solid show with those first four episodes, then Episode 5 didn't really do much at all, and then Episode 6 completely took the wind out of the show's sales and is the worst thing the MCU's ever did, that one finale episode. It is a disaster. I can't believe this show exists. It is just a mess. You can see, with all the reshoots and production issues, this is clearly always going to be a bit of a disaster, and so yeah, this is the worst show they've made. This is one of the worst projects. It's a complete mess of a series in every single way, and the biggest disappointment by far. This really sucks to watch play out like that. Number 46, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Uh, another one that people were expecting to be low. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't hate this movie. I watched it in the theater. I had fun watching it, but it looks really weird. Like, you can tell it's on the volume. It's a lot of blue and brown sludge. The visual style isn't great. Putting a small guy in the quantum realm is interesting at first, but there's no sense of scale. So when he looks big, if you just tell me this shot is him at normal size in the quantum realm, I believe you because we have no point of reference. I really like the family dynamics. Scott and Cassie, they are great together. They carry this movie for you. I don't even hate what they did with Modok. I wish they didn't kill him off, but Modok being this whiny baby 
has always kind of been his thing. But yeah, Quantumania, I'd say it's just okay again. It should have been better, especially when they're introducing Kang, but this is another one that was pretty underwhelming. I've watched it a few times since it released last year, and I think it's completely overhated online, but it's definitely towards the bottom of my list. Number 45, Thor Love and Thunder, which is another movie I'm pretty sure you all saw coming, and a movie I would say, hot take, it's a fun movie if you don't take it seriously know all the problems going in and how they barely show gore butchering any gods which is incredibly disappointing which you're gonna hear me say a lot but the movie just doesn't work very well it fits two big stories from the comics being jane as the mighty thor and gore the god butcher into one movie that was mandated to be under two hours which did not work the humor is all over the place with genuinely some really funny bits in there the like the stormbreaker bit is amazing the goats they got me but overall the movie just doesn't land as well as it should natalie portman it was amazing to get to see her play mighty thor in return after all this time and her story was handled really well but everything else around it just kind of falls apart and i do hope we get another thor movie i think he deserves one last one especially with hercules introduced but taiko itd's fall off has been hard since ragnarok so i think it's time to just put this in the past and reinvent thor because it should have been better Number 44, Thor 1, which might be a hot take, but I rewatched it a few years ago and it just didn't hit the same as when I first saw it. The hard shift from sci-fi fantasy epic to quirky small town comedy is fun. It's a really enjoyable movie to watch. It just happens to shake out towards the bottom of my list. I have nothing against it. It's just not a movie I really find myself thinking about often or rewatching. Loki, fantastic villain. There's a lot of characters in here that get some play. We don't really see anymore like the Warriors 3, but it just doesn't hit as hard as the others for me, which I don't know if it's a hot take or not, but I'm just not the biggest fan of Thor 1. It worked, it set up Thor, it got him on Earth, introduced him to Nick Fury, introduced Hawkeye to the universe, but it's just not as good as other movies on this list. Number 43. Doctor Strange, which is a movie I think is good. This is the first one where we get into movies that I think are definitively good. Doctor Strange, I know a lot of people have a lot of different thoughts on it, where it's some people's favorites I've seen, it's some people's least favorites. I think it's just good and that's it. There's a lot of really great ideas and scenes in here that are trapped in a movie with a forgettable villain that doesn't really dive into how wonderful the world of magic should be, but Benedict Cumberbatch is amazing. Wong, the goat. There's a lot of really interesting ideas in here, like I love the scene where Strange says he swore an oath that might be my favorite Doctor Strange scene still in the MCU, but overall, I don't think it delivered on what it should have been, but I still think it's a good movie. It gets a lot of hate that I don't think is necessarily warranted, because it's carried heavily by Benedict Cumberbatch's performance, and the characters become so iconic, and it all started here in a movie that's still pretty good. It's a lot of fun to watch, even if it isn't perfect. Number 42, Avengers Age of Ultron which is another movie that I think is good. It's enjoyable. It gets a lot of hate on there that I don't think is warranted. The dynamic between the Avengers is perfect. This is exactly how they should be, where they're still butting heads a little, but the scene where they try and lift Nolnir is incredible and the best scene of that movie, but they just repeat a lot of the beats from Avengers 1 over again, which is really disappointing to see because it should have been so much more with a villain like Ultron. The Bruce Nat romance just doesn't work for me. But then there's some other stuff that does really work, like Ultron has some truly terrifying scenes in there. I really like everything they do with Captain America. That's my guy right there. That's my goat. That's his best costume, by the way. I will maintain his Age of Ultron suit is the best one in the entire MCU. But the movie holds itself back by adding in unnecessary teases to the Infinity Saga with the whole Thor vision pool scene, which is like, why are you putting this in there? This is not necessary. But then there's some stuff that does work, like Hawkeye's farm is great. It works well, seeing the Avengers at their absolute lowest, having to turn to a uh, shield hideaway base where Hawkeye lives with his secret family. But yeah, the movie, it was another disappointment because it just did a lot of the same. We didn't get much new. Number 41. Iron Fist, which the first season, terrible. I hated that. <laughs> it's like a corporate espionage type show for some reason, and it's just all about this one company. In the action scenes, they barely had any time to choreograph them, and poor Finn Jones didn't get to show how good he was. It was just a weird take on the character. It just does not land much at all. It feels way too long, there's too much filler, and it should not be what an Iron Fist show is. Now, first season, bad. The second season is really good, and it doesn't get talked about enough. I really like the change they do. They fix Danny's character. Colleen Wing is one of the best characters in the entire MCU. They better bring her back. You're gonna hear me say that a lot for a lot of these Netflix characters. But that first season really weighs it down and put it down here. If it was just the second season, you'd see this a lot higher up. But it's really far down here, which is a shame. Number 40, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now, I like this movie. Again, I think it's good. Ghost is one of the best villains in the entire MCU. I will die on this hill, even though she's not really a villain, but you know what I mean. She's a great antagonist, and I can't wait to see her again in Thunderbolts. It's a fun movie coming right after Infinity War. It's a nice palate cleanser. It's just not one of the better ones, and that's fine. 
It's fun. I love the dynamic between Scott and Hope in there. This is the movie where the Wasp actually gets stuff to do, which is nice. Hank Pym is fun, but they also kind of dumb Scott's character down a little bit, which isn't perfect. But again, it's a nice comfort movie. Just something you can put on and have fun watching. It's reliable, but it's just not in the upper echelon of Marvel movies, and that's okay. Number 39, Ant-Man, with these two movies back to back. Ant-Man, I think, is a good movie. I really enjoy it. The shrinking scenes are at their best here. It's a lot of fun seeing him fight in the briefcase or with Thomas the Tank Engine. Yellow Jacket is a pretty forgettable villain, but it's just a lot of the same. It's one of the movies that follows the Marvel formula more than others, but I still think it's fun. Paul Rudd is great as Scott Lang. He's really fun as the Ant-Man. Michael Douglas, great Hank Pym. I really wish he had more to do in these movies. The whole crew that Scott has with the X-Cons, they're a lot of fun. Luis's stories are great. I love the Falcon cameo. It's great to see him appear in these things. And yeah, it's, it's a good movie. It's just not perfect. It's a little formulaic and that's fine. It came out at a time where that was what Marvel was doing. But yeah, I just think it's a good fun movie and that's all you need sometimes. Hi, hello. Quick intermission as I realized while I'm editing the video that I just completely forgot to rank what if. I was so excited that there were exactly 50 Marvel projects that I guess I just missed one. So I don't want to redo all the numbering for the previous ones. That's a lot of work and I don't feel like doing it. So you're just gonna have to deal with this because I'm gonna throw what if in right here. I'm gonna keep this quick because I got a lot more to edit, but What If I think is a really fun show. The first season is pretty good. I think the second season is a lot stronger and is genuinely great, and I think it's a show that everybody should watch if you haven't. It's a lot of fun multiverse stories, some great scenarios in there. My favorite episode of the entire series would probably be the Cohorty episode. I really like how they introduce a new character. I think it does a really great job with that, and I'm excited for season three. A lot of potential there, and I can't wait to see what they do with it. Number 38, we have Captain Marvel, which might be another hot take. I honestly wish I had this higher because I like this movie a lot. I would go as far as to say it's almost great. I know the villains aren't perfect. If I asked you right now, can you tell me the villain of Captain Marvel? His name is Jan Rog. No, I don't know why I know this. Probably because I'm obsessive about Marvel. But like Jan Rog is not a great villain. But Brie Larson is perfect as Carol Danvers. I would die for her in a heartbeat. This rating is nothing against her. It's just the movie isn't as good as it should be. But I still think it's really good. I enjoy watching it every time. She has such a screen presence to her that makes this work really well. The whole twist with the scrolls I never saw coming and I think is what makes this movie as good as it is because as a comic fan everybody always thinks the scrolls are bad so that twist is really good at subverting expectations and helps to make this movie work but it just is again a little formulaic and the villains are forgettable. It's a really good movie and it's a shame it has to be down this low but it's just compared to other movies this is where it all shakes out. At number 37 we have Black Widow which is another movie that again you're gonna hear this a lot because a lot of Marvel movies are over Hated, but I see a lot of people say this is the worst Marvel movie on Twitter, which is not at all. I think it's great to see Natasha finally get her own movie. Yes, obviously it came a few years late and would have been perfect to release this after Civil War, but there's a big racist and sexist guy at the helm of Marvel named Ike Perlmutter who wouldn't let them do it. So better late than never, and it's nice to see her get that solo spotlight. The family dynamic with Red Guardian and Melina and Yelena is amazing. Yelena Belova is one of the funniest characters in the MCU. I'd watch anything she does. So Taskmaster isn't handled very well. I just think the personality is wrong, and that's kind of what holds this back for me from being higher, that whole Taskmaster twist. I like the idea that Taskmaster is a ghost from Natasha's past coming back to haunt her. I don't like the idea that it's a completely new character with different personality and everything like that, and they could have just picked a different spy from the Marvel Universe and it would have been fine. But yeah, Black Widow, I think it's a good movie. I really enjoy it. It just comes in here at number 37. Number 36, Ms. Marvel, which is a show that I hate putting this low because Amon Vellani as Kamala Khan is top three casting choices of all time. I would die for her in a heartbeat. She's everything to me. But this show is really conflicting for me because those first three episodes are fantastic. The pilot especially is still like top five Marvel TV episodes ever. I love how they set up her world and with all the cute little animatics they put in there. It's so good. But then it takes this hard pivot into time travel and a completely different story and moving away from the coming of age story that I really like, which was a bummer. I still think the stuff they do in that whole time travel arc is good. It's entertaining, but it's just not what I want to see the character doing, if that makes sense. I love the ties into her culture. It's really cool getting to explore that, but the show is at its strongest when it's focusing on Kamala coming of age, a fan of superheroes in a world where they're everywhere and her getting these powers and trying to find her place there. And I think the finale is one of the stronger Marvel finales. I'm one of the people who doesn't mind the power change. I like the polymorph powers better, but I think that these hard light abilities still work for her. It's it's just the show takes that hard twist that has it down this low. I still really like the show. I'd say the show is great. It's just compared to everything else.
else it doesn't go as high as it could be and i hope that we get a second season and they could focus on what worked in the previous one because i would watch 80 seasons more of aman Vellani just being the best actor of our time number 35 is iron man which might be a hot take having it this low it obviously started the universe you could not have the mc without this movie it is great robert downey jr perfect casting you cannot get better than him this set the tone for the entire mcu it changed the entire comic book landscape and i'm so happy this movie exists that being said, it got its flaws, mostly with Obadiah Stane randomly going crazy, but I do love how Tony beats him by learning from his mistakes and Stane not doing it with the suit. I think that's great. It's really funny. The whole movie works so well. The Nick Fury tease at the end sets up so much for the future. I appreciate this movie and what it represents so much. It's great. It's not perfect. And there's movies on this list that I think work a lot better than this one does. And you know what? That's okay. Number 34 is the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special, which is a project I'm really glad that exists. It is so much fun. Another thing I just watched last Christmas, I love seeing Mantis and Drax get the spotlight because they're my favorite pairing of Guardians, and they're so chaotic together. And having them kidnap Kevin Bacon, like, that's one of the funniest premises in the entire MCU. It's such a low-stakes project. There's not even a villain. It's just here to set some things up for Volume 3 in a fun way, and I really love it. I would love more projects like this, and it's always nice to see the Guardians. Number 33 is The Defenders, which is the big culmination of all the Netflix series up to this point. You've got Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and they're all taken down. Sigourney Weaver, for some reason, and she has dragon bones in this city, which is important. What is important are the character dynamics, because this show nails them. Daredevil is as great as ever. Jessica Jones interacting with everyone with their signature sarcasm is so good. Matt and Jessica's relationship is amazing. We get the heroes for hire interacting together, Luke Cage and Iron Fist. Their dynamic is a lot of fun. This is when they really start to fix the Iron Fist character, and I would have loved Love to see them get a spin-off out of it. Plot's a little bit nonsensical, it's all over the place, but what really carries the show for me is the action and the character interactions. That's when the series is at its strongest, when it's just the characters BSing together. Or the one-take fight scene, I think in episode four, is a lot of fun. I've rewatched that more times than I can count. Sure the show have been better? Yeah, I still think it's great just because of all the character interactions. Number 32, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, which if you look at Twitter, this is public enemy number one, but you should never look at Twitter. It's, it's a hell site. Please save yourself. Don't look at Twitter. This movie, I think it has that Raimi sauce to it. Raimi's directing is amazing. Obviously the goat for a reason. If you compare this to the previous movie, the stylistic overhaul is beautiful. The color grading is amazing. I really love the story of having Doctor Strange trying to just find happiness. That's such a simple concept, but it works so well for a man who always has to hold the knife. Obviously there's some cameo stuff in there, which some people have a problem with. I don't. I think it works well for the movie because they're important to the story. My problems mostly come in the fact that Doctor Strange is kind of overshadowed by Wanda. She's a great villain. Darkhold is fun. Wong the goat, he's in there. But yeah, I just think there's movies better than it. But Multiverse of Madness is great and the best Doctor Strange movie by far. I'm really excited to see where he goes from here. Number 31, Iron Man 3. It's a hot take, I know. I think Iron Man 3 is the best Iron Man movie by a landslide. I love Iron Man 3. I was there in line at the theater day one. This movie is so good. Is the Mandarin twist poorly executed? Yes, I was really excited to be in the Mandarin and him just having an actor. It's kind of messy and I wish they handled the idea that it's just some guy using a terrorist to cover up all of his actions. I think that's a really interesting idea. Then you have Aldrich Killian screaming, I am the Mandarin! And it's like, alright man, it's a bit on the nose. You could have done this better, but showing that Tony Stark is still Iron Man without the armor is amazing. The movie is so funny. I still quote this constantly. And yeah, I just think, great movie. I have a lot of fun with it and people are way too hard on it just because of the Mandarin twist when it is the best Iron Man movie and seeing Tony have to deal with PTSD is such a good story. Like Shane Black is a great director and I'm so glad they gave it to him and I wish we got more movies like this one because it's really a character study on Tony Stark and it dissects it and breaks his character down and shows what makes him so interesting. At number 30 we have Echo, the most recent Marvel project as of this recording and I think is a great series. Maya Lopez has immediately become one of my favorite characters. They did change her powers but I think the way they did it works really well and still honors the character. I love how violent the show is at times. Obviously the Daredevil cameo is very important to me. That whole like one take fight scene is beautiful and I love it so much. I'm really excited to see more Daredevil and more of Maya because the character work they do in this series is amazing. Her dynamic with Kingpin off the charts. They have such great chemistry together and Alakwa Cox is such a star. The fact that Maya Lopez is the first and only role she's ever had as an actress is insane to me. She is so talented and I hope they make 30 more seasons of this show just so we can see more of her acting. She is such a screen presence. She's terrifying when she needs to be and I really love what they did with this show. The finale is my only problem. It's a little rushed and I would have appreciated maybe another episode but otherwise 
guys, yeah, I think this is a great show and it deserves more praise. I'm really happy to see it doing so well in streaming because there are a lot of people saying, oh, we don't need an Echo show. And I don't think we need you, all right? I like this show a lot and I think it's really great. At 29, we have Luke Cage, which is a Netflix series, obviously, and one that I think doesn't get enough appreciation. I really like what they do with the character. It does a lot of really nice political commentary with Luke Cage being this black icon in the city of Harlem. Mike Coulter does a great performance, another character who should come back and challenge Fisk for the mayor of New York City. I would love to see him return. He is such a presence to him. The show isn't perfect. The pacing is a little wonky, but Mike Coulter is just so good in the series, and he just has this aura to him, and I love everything he does. I really want to see more Luke cage because the ending i don't want to spoil it but that ending shot and what it's set up it's such a good premise and i'm so mad we didn't get a third season despite it all being planned and the series is one that does not get talked about enough it's the netflix show that deserves more appreciation and at 28 we have the punisher which i think is a great series that really dives into what makes frank castle tick i think it does a really good job of showing this underground crime world as frank is tortured and tries to hunt down the people that did things to his family i do think the show is a little convoluted which i don't think is a hot take to say but i think that john bernthal's performance carries it a lot you got mike on the first season your relationship with amy which i think is a great dynamic between the two but it being a little convoluted has that a bit lower they really drag out frank's murder plot and they kind of fumble jigsaw's appearance with that weird mask it's not as good as the show should be but in a bubble i think the show works it's good it's entertaining the violence is next level and it's so satisfying just watching frank go in there and kill as many bad people as possible i cannot wait to see him back in born again because he is such a presence on screen number 27 is hawkeye which is a series that doesn't get enough credit it deserves much more appreciation Haley Steinfeld, uh, Are You Free Thursday Night, first of all. And second is amazing as Kate Bishop. Kate Bishop is my favorite female character. I love everything about her. I read that My Life is a Weapon Run, and I immediately fell in love with the character. She's so cool. And it's a different take in this series. She's more of a girl fail, and you know what? I love that for her. She's so cool, and I wish I could put this at number one just for her. But the series cuts out a lot of stuff for Clint. He doesn't get as much play, even though I love that they give him the hearing aids, which is nice to see. The Kingpin reveal is amazing, but they cut out a lot of scenes for the sake of shock value and i think the show would be a lot higher on if they put those scenes in and kingpin was a more prominent presence throughout the entire series that being said i still think it's great i rewatch it every christmas it's one of my favorite marvel projects it's like a comfort project for me i think it's really good and people need to start appreciating the show more and number 26 we have captain america the first avenger which is a movie that is very important to me it's the first real exposure i had to captain america as a character after seeing him in animated series and comics as a kid he's my all-time favorite hero so this movie is interesting introduction to that character in a really fun period piece that shows what makes Steve Rogers so special. That scene of him covering the grenade and giving his life is just chef's kiss. And I really love that Steve Rogers, morally, he does not change at all. He changes the person and grows, learning to not trust the government and stuff like that. But he stays as a character all throughout. And it's him changing the people around him just by being a good man. And I think that works so well. Obviously, you got the Red Skull in there, which is awesome to see him get his ass kicked. Bucky dying, setting up Winter Soldier. It's just a lot of fun. They don't make them like this anymore because it's a true period piece in every way and I will go to bat for this film any day. It is such a good Captain America movie and really does a good job of introducing the character to modern audiences in a way that seemed hard for a character named Captain America to kind of get the world's attention and become such a success. It just speaks to how good this movie is and it means a lot to me. I love it so much. At the halfway point now with number 25, WandaVision, which was the first Marvel Studios produced series. It was the first project in phase 4 coming after the huge success from Endgame and Far From Home and obviously the show is great. I love the mystery aspect of it, the thriller, the horror elements that are thrown in there. Watching this week to week and waking up at 3am and just seeing everybody on Twitter react to it and theorize about the insane things happening is amazing. I think it works so well to kind of break down Wanda's character as she's grieving over the loss of the vision. Like having a sitcom parody thriller starring a witch and a robot man should not work on paper but it does because the craftsmanship and how they actually like film this stuff on live studio audiences and filmed each episode as if it was being made in the era that it was and it falls apart a little bit in the finale i think the finale is fine but overall the show is still great and by far one of the best things the mcu has done i love seeing this kind of artistic freedom and creativity and every project should strive to be at least this creative and inventive with their ideas number 24 is spider-man far from home and is another movie that means a lot to me because that is my all-time favorite villain mysterio in it i love that goofy fishbowl guy he's so good in jake gyllenhaal steals the show as him 
him. I love how campy he is and over the top. And it has, I'd say, the third best Spider-Man suit of all time, that black and red suit. It is gorgeous. And a lot of people have problems with it because, oh, it's another movie where he's Iron Boy Jr. Shut up. Tom Holland is such a good Spider-Man. He's my favorite Spider-Man for a reason. Seeing him have to deal with these new responsibilities put on him where the world wants him to be something that he's not and learning that with great power comes great responsibility through a different way where he's already learned that message but now he's trying to see what happens when he gives up the responsibility he gives it to someone he makes a wrong choice and i just think it's a really good spider-man story it may not take place in new york it might be a larger scale than normal spider-man stories but it still gets the core of the character right and it does it through the lens of a child making a decision that he wasn't ready for and having to grasp at those ramifications and i think it's amazing and again it has jake gyllenhaal's mysterio in it so i'm gonna love this movie forever Number 23 is The Marvels, which is a movie that did not get a fair chance in theaters. The strikes really kneecapped the film. It didn't get a lot of people seeing it, which is a real shame because I genuinely think this movie is great. The dynamic between Carol, Monica, and especially Kamala is fantastic. It's so much fun to watch. And while Star Ben might not be the strongest villain, and you can really tell they cut a lot of the movie out, which is a bit disappointing, I think everything else really works. It's just a lot of fun to see them all interacting together and builds off of the first Captain Marvel movie really well. The action in it is spectacular. It's some of the best in the entire MCU. All of them switching places that they're trying to fight in the beginning of the film is just so satisfying to watch and has a lot of really good jokes in there, mostly from Kamala. She's just the best, one of my all-time favorite characters. Iman Falani is so talented and genuine in everything she does. It's also the best we've had Carol Danvers up to this point. It's really nice to see Brie finally get some room to show how good she is as an actor playing Captain Marvel. And Monica Rambeau is a fantastic addition to the MCU. She was great in WandaVision. She's really great here. You can dive into her character and how kind of hurt she feels by Carol leaving and having to get this whole weight put on her shoulders and then of course that end fight with Darben where they just jump her and beat the shit out of her is so 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 satisfying to watch we need more superhero fights where the team just gets together and just absolutely destroy someone it's so good I will defend this movie my entire life I think it's severely underrated and it's absolutely in the top half of Marvel movies it's really good and more people need to give it a chance at number 22 we have She-Hulk Attorney at Law which might be controversial having it this high but I don't care I'm gonna make a video about this one day I love this show I will defend it every single day I will go to war for this show. Tatiana Maslany as Jennifer Walters is one of the best casting choices in the entire comic book movie genre. She brings so much life to every scene she's in. She's hilarious to watch, and yes, I know some of the CGI is a little shoddy, but I can excuse that when the show is as entertaining as it is. She is just a joy to watch, and the dynamic between her and Bruce is fun. You really feel like they're actual cousins. Obviously, it has that amazing Daredevil episode, which is one of the best episodes of Marvel TV yet, and did a great job introducing him to the MCU, and is still my favorite interpretation of Daredevil to this date. The finale, completely breaking the fourth wall is really fun and brilliant. I love the idea of Jen just harassing the writers for making a bad finale. I wish she was there for Secret Invasion. I really love this show. It uses the TV format better than any other Marvel series because each episode is standalone and furthers the main plot. It's not like these six episode series that just feel like one long movie. This actually feels like a TV show and you could just sit down and watch any episode at any time and I like that a lot about it and I really hope it gets a season two one day because it deserved so much better and you just have to give them more time to cook so they can actually make the effects match because there are some scenes where the shield model looks actually really good but it's buried between a lot of shoddy cgi which i think people like to write the whole show off for but i enjoy it a lot i think it's a lot of fun it's so enjoyable to watch and tatiana maslani is a gem Number 21, we have Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is a show that means a lot to me because it helped me realize my new favorite character in the MCU is Sam Wilson, who I just absolutely adore. And this series does a fantastic job of putting him in the spotlight and making him our new Captain America. Steve Rogers, my all-time favorite character. So I was really excited when they made Sam Cap because I think he has the more interesting story to tell and it makes more sense for the MCU's universe. And this story does a great job of handling that and showing how hard it must be for a black man to become Captain America in today's climate. John Walker is a fantastic villain. I love love how nuanced he is and he just genuinely does want to do a good job but he's being manipulated by these outside forces where he doesn't think he's good enough and you see him with this slow descent in the villainy he was always kind of a douche in the beginning but he's one of the most well-written characters in the entire mcu to where i completely buy into wyatt russell's performance and it's just this completely despicable character by the end and also really helps to prop up sam's story and show why he's the right fit to be captain america and then you have bucky's whole story with him trying to move past the winter soldier he's going to therapy he's trying to make right by all these wrongs and it's a really in 
in-depth look at this character who's been suffering for the better part of 70 years, and I think it does a great job of putting Sam and Bucky at the center because they're my favorite duo in the entire MCU. They're so funny, and it's nice to see them get this time to just bond and go from people who used to hate each other to now are genuine friends. And then the way it props up Sam as Captain America in the finale, it just makes me so happy. I've watched this show many times. I'm going to keep watching it, and I think it deserves a lot more credit. It's got some of the best cinematography in the entire MCU. It's got some really good action scenes, like when they're just beating the shit out of Walker, and it's just a great character study at the core. And I think it's really interesting. I will always love this show and how it told Sam Wilson's story, and I'm begging to see Sam again, because that's my guy right there, right? That's my favorite dude. I want to see him so bad, because this show just made me fall in love with him as a character. Coming in at number 20 is Spider-Man Homecoming, a movie that I really love and was a fantastic introduction to the MCU Spider-Man. We get a taste of him in Civil War and seeing him interact with other Avengers, but now that he's on his own, it is just a great movie that really understands Spider-Man as a character. And again, you get these stupid Iron Boy Jr. complaints, which to an extent I get from the surface, but when you look at it deeper, it's just Peter looking up to someone, kind of seeing the flaws they have in them, and realizing that he can't be that person. He needs to be who he is, and that is a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. This is by far the most grounded Spider-Man movie to date. You really get a sense of him helping out the neighborhood as you see him going around town and stopping bike thieves and just trying to make a difference. It's a really good way to see how Spider-Man sticks up for the little guy, and I love that a lot. The Vulture is one of the best MCU villains still to this day. He is so terrifying and threatening, but you also have to kind of feel for him because the story they have with damage control, it's so good. And Michael Keaton kills it. That car scene, the light flashes the second he realizes who Spider-Man is. It's really good filmmaking, and the twist with the Vulture being Liz's dad is so good. I really didn't expect it to come out of nowhere, and it's just a great way of seeing Spider-Man in an established universe on this lower scale. I could rewatch this endlessly, because I really do think this is one of the better Spider-Man live-action movies. It is so good, and I love it, and Tom Holland will always be my favorite Spider-Man. Number 19 is Jessica Jones, which I think is by far the second best Netflix series. If we were just going on the first season, this would be in the top five MCU. That first season is a masterpiece that perfectly shows Jessica Jones as a character. Kristen Ritter is perfectly cast as her. I think she does a great job bringing Jessica's pain and sarcasm to the surface and walking that line between the two where, yeah, she's sarcastic, but when you get down to it, she is a deeply troubled person who has gone through a lot of horrible things, and it's so satisfying watching her just destroy Kilgrave, who is one of the best villains in the entire MCU. I cannot believe that's David Tennant giving such a chilling performance to where I just actually despise him. And it gets my stomach twisting. The second season's a little messier with her mother, but I don't think it's bad. I think it's still good. It's just not as good as that perfect first season. And then this third season, nobody watched except me because this is when they were canceling all the Netflix shows. But I think the third season is pretty strong and Fool Killer is a fun villain. It's nice seeing Jessica try and step into this world as a hero with Trish who just only wants to be that and is doing everything she can to get powers. It's a great dynamic between the two of them. But what sells the entire series is Kristen Ritter. Her star power in the show is unmatched. And I hope that they bring her back soon because she is just phenomenal in the role. At number 18, we have Guardians of the Galaxy which is a film that myself included when it was first announced. I don't think anyone really had a clue what was going on, but I remember sitting down in that theater, and the second I heard Come and Get Your Love drop in the beginning, I knew I was going to be in for a treat. This movie completely reinvents the Guardians of the Galaxy for the MCU while still keeping the core themes of the characters alive, and it does it in such a nice and emotional way. James Gunn will always be one of my favorite directors, and this is the movie that helped me realize how talented he was with everybody's dynamics and backstory getting a lot of play, and they feel like a real team. The only problem I have with this movie that holds it back from being completely perfect is that Ronan the Accuser is a bit of a weak villain, but I can excuse that when you have one of the funniest and most creative movies going that feels like this really modern space opera in a way, set to these nostalgic 80s tunes which are just really good. It might have the best soundtrack of all the Guardians movies. I rewatched it last year in preparation for Volume 3 and I loved it even more. Every time I see this, I just find myself finding new things to appreciate. Number 17 is Black Panther, which is a phenomenal movie. It won Academy Award. It goes without saying how beloved this movie is. Not only does it have one of the best MCU villains in Killmonger who who still stands the test of time as a phenomenal villain where you still completely believe in his cause just not the way he's executing it and of course the late great Chadwick Boseman is one of the biggest stars we had and I dearly miss him because him as T'Challa is amazing casting you really believed everything he was doing he has such a presence to him he could walk the line between serious and witty and it's a real shame that this is the only movie he got to lead in the MCU because his character is one of the best we had and I truly love everything they did with him 
The world of Wakanda is beautiful. I love the Afro-futuristic technology they have going on. The aesthetic is amazing. The score is phenomenal. There's so much to love in this movie. I will always be a fan of it. Ryan Coogler does some of the best directing the entire MCU. You can tell how passionate and creative he is about this, and I think that it has so much praise for a good reason. It deserves everything it's gotten, and I really love this movie. This is a phenomenal film, and one of the best the MCU has to offer. At number 16, we have Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, a movie I instantly fell in love with watching it at the theater. It's still to this day is the best action in the entire MCU. The hand-to-hand -hand combat on that film is unmatched and so satisfying to watch. I love all the techniques, and I love how they change the Ten Rings in these iron bands. They're so fun to watch, and they can have some really creative uses. Wen Wu is one of my top five favorite villains. Tony Leung does a fantastic job, and you really feel for him, but he's so charismatic and threatening, and I love everything he's doing in there. Simu Liu is a great addition to the MCU. He brings so much life to every scene he's in, whether it's doing karaoke or having to ride a dragon. It feels authentic, and I love everything he's doing. A great exploration of new cultures and corners of the MCU, and I'm really excited to see this character again, because not only was this made by one of my favorite directors, Dustin Daniel Cretton, who I think does a great job with everything, not only does it have a great score, but it's just a really enjoyable Marvel movie. And at a time where Marvel was trying new things, Shang-Chi is a great example of what new creative ideas can be, where they took this D-list character, and now he's a household name because of how well the movie did. At number 15, we have Werewolf by Night. The first ever Marvel Studios special presentation, which completely set the bar at a fantastic short that introduced a bunch of new characters. It nails the horror vibe and that old Universal Monster movie aesthetic they were going for. I can't believe that this is Michael Giacchino's first time ever directing because he kills it in every way. Jack Russell, the werewolf, is just really fun to watch as he's trying the whole time to save his friend and avoid turning into the werewolf. And then when he does, it just turns into this bloodbath, which is really cool to watch. Elsa Bloodstone is a great addition to the MCU. I love her energy. But of course, the show stealer is my man, Thing Ted, who is so funny. And I love that when people fear him, they burn at the touch of the man thing. And his dynamic with Jack feels real because they're just basically guys being dudes and how Jack always has to get him out of the craziest situations. It's just a lot of fun, this special. It nails the horror elements. It is a really cool aesthetic. Even the colored version looks gorgeous. Like, I don't know if you guys have watched that, but you really should because they put a black and white filter over everything. But in color, it still looks great. And I really hope Marvel do more special presentations like this or with these characters or hopefully, please, one day we get the Midnight Suns because there's so much potential to expand on this corner of the universe. At number 14, we have Guardians of the Galaxy. Galaxy Volume 2, a movie that improves on everything from the first film. You have a better villain in Ego the Living Planet, who is just really charismatic because it's Kurt Russell, but he's also so sinister with the way he killed Peter's mom so carelessly to the point where he can brag about it and he thinks Peter won't care. I know I just said Volume 1 has the better soundtrack, but I feel like I like Volume 2's more. It's so good. I still listen to it all the time. I'm going to listen to it while I'm editing this video. And the team dynamic is great. The additions of Mantis and Yandu work really well. I like how more of the Guardians get time to shine, whereas the first movie was very clearly a star film, and you get to learn about the other characters, but this movie really dives into all of them. You, you see how troubled Rocket is, and that partnership with Yandu works so well together. Peter and Gamora's romance gets center stage. Drax and Mantis become my favorite pairing of the Guardians. It balances emotion and comedy better than maybe any other James Gunn movie, and I think it's just a phenomenal film. It deserves all the appreciation it gets. I think this really improves on the Guardians of the Galaxy and delivers on the definitive version of this team. I didn't even mention how cute Baby Groot is. Like, look at that guy. I would kill for him. I'll kill anyone for him. At number 13 is a controversial take, but we have The Eternals because for some reason, this is the lowest rated MCU project and I despise that because I think this movie is genuinely amazing. This is peak comic book cinema right here. I don't understand how some people walked out of it and thought this movie was bad. I think Chloe Zhao does a phenomenal job directing it and giving this movie so much style. The Eternals themselves are greatly cast. Like, look at this roster. This team is stacked with some of the biggest A-listers in Hollywood and they're all doing great jobs with some fantastic performance performances. Specifically, Gemma Chan, Cersei is amazing. She's my favorite member of the team, but you cannot deny the screen presence that Drake has. Barry Keegan is such a good actor, and his dynamic with Makari is one of the best and most natural romances of the MCU to where everybody is obsessed with them, and you know what? I get it. And I just love how this movie handles the idea of introducing the Eternals. It explains where they were and the conflict they have within themselves where they want to interfere, but their only purpose is to fulfill what Arishem wants, and it's nice seeing them defy those orders finally after all this time, and I just think it's a beautiful movie. It breaks the MCU formula in a lot of ways. It's more serious than the films. It has a distinct visual style and it just stands out and I really don't understand how people hate this movie. I think it is phenomenal. I love it so much. I will always defend it and I think it deserves so much more praise. If, if you don't like Eternals, please let me know in the comments down below because I do not understand how some people can't like this film. It baffles me to this day what people have wrong with it because my only flaw is that I wish they was longer for the characters to have more time to shine and to learn more about them. I think it's so 
good. And the villain twist where Icarus is the villain all along. And yeah, him flying into the sun is a little on the nose. But I don't care. I think that's cool. And I really like it. I'd also fly it into the sun if I lost Gemma Chan. Like, can you blame the guy? It's just a great movie that deserves so much more praise. And if you don't like this movie, that's fair enough. But I urge you to go into it with an open mind and rewatch it. Because every time I do, I find myself finding more things to like about it. Number 12 is Black Panther Wakanda Forever which is going to be hard to talk about because this film I cannot get through without crying. It is one of the hardest watches I've ever had to do. I've seen it a few times and I never escape it without bawling my eyes out. It is a beautiful and touching tribute to Chadwick Boseman while also handling the future of Wakanda seamlessly. Letitia Wright really steps it up as Shuri in the film. She does a great job carrying the weight of losing not just her brother, but her mother as well. And she really steps it up in this role going from just the silly side character to a grief struck in main lead of the movie who you buy is going through a lot. And it hurts to watch as she goes through all this thing. She might be the character in the MC who suffered the most. It is a really powerful movie that also really pushes the universe forward more than maybe any other film in Phase 4. With the introduction of Namor and Talokan, fantastic villain. It's a great interpretation of that character. I love everything they did with it. I cannot wait to see him again because he is electric on screen where he's chemistry with everybody so you can't help but like him. But when he gets serious, he will threaten you to no end. And that war he wants to wage with Wakanda is really interesting. And I just think it's such a beautiful movie. I think it's better than the first Black Panther their movie which might be a hot take but this movie is special it is so unique you can see with every frame how much love and care was put into it it is some really powerful stuff and regardless how some people feel about the mcu you have to appreciate what this movie went through because it's gone through a lot of hard changes and they still managed to make a film that's this good and i always have a deep admiration for this film with so much passion put into it at number 11, we have maybe a controversial take putting it this low, but it is Avengers Endgame, the big culmination to 10 years of storytelling with the Infinity Saga, and I think this is the best version of the movie we could have gotten. It is a miracle that it works as well as it does, this three hour long epic divided into three distinct chunks, and it is a remarkable film. I have never watched a movie more than this in theaters where I saw it three different times, and each time I found myself liking it more than the last. I love how it handles the effects of the snap to where it really shook the Avengers. The five year time jump is such a bold move that pays off really well because all these characters get to grow and progress. My only problems with it that makes it so it doesn't crack the top 10 is is that the Hulk story happens off screen. I would really like to see Hulk merging the two minds together and giving us Professor Hulk, even if it was just like a quick scene in there. But that's the only problem I really have with this movie. But everybody else gets a lot of depth. Obviously, Steve and Tony are at the forefront. This is their big send off. Natasha gets a lot to do. And introducing time travel to the MCU is a huge gamble because it makes things confusing. I think the timeline logic makes a lot of sense here. And I really like what they did with how time travel doesn't affect the future. It just creates a branch timeline. It makes more sense. It makes things more interesting because the ramifications of that meaning you can't just undo things it's a lot easier to understand and it just does a great job the callbacks in the film are so rewarding as a longtime fan where you have things getting paid off from years ago like obviously the biggest and most important one to me is captain america finally being worthy of mjolnir which i got spoiled for me and is the worst thing that ever happened to me i was gonna make the national news after getting that spoiled to me in the theater i still couldn't believe watching it happen it meant the world to me and then he got his happy ending which was very satisfying to see Tony's death is still hard to watch it's so so heartbreaking but I think is the perfect end for him as he gets the send off and makes the sacrifice play it is an achievement in filmmaking second biggest movie of all time for a reason it is a cultural event that there will never be anything like again this movie is special it is one of a kind and I am so glad that it exists now as we finally enter the top 10 this is where things get serious as we get into my favorite MCU projects and at number 10 we have Moon Knight which is a show that means a lot to me because Moon Knight, for a decade now, being one of my all-time favorite characters, I love the Moon Knight system of Mark, Steven, and Jake. I've read so many of his comics. The Jeff Lemire run is my all-time favorite comic series. I have read that so many times. So I was so excited for Moon Knight to finally get his time to shine in the spotlight and go from being called, quote-unquote, Marvel's Batman, which he's not! And if you say that, I'm going to throw a brick at your head, to people finally seeing what an interesting character he is and how much he has to offer. To some people, aren't the biggest fan of the show because it's a completely different interpretation of the character from the comics but every single Moon Knight run is different from the last and always does something new with the character so this taking it a new way with the mystical elements works for me I think it does the character justice and keeps the core alive with his dissociative identity disorder and I really buy the performance Oscar Isaac is giving with all the different alters it's a unique Marvel show because at its core it is a character study more than it is a 
much superhero show. There's obviously the big fights and the cool costumes, but the series is more interested in showing you Mark Spector and Stephen Grant as these two identities kind of vie for control, and a deeply troubled man is trying to make the most of what he has, and I think it's really interesting. I think Caro is an unsung villain. He's not perfect, but I think he's really interesting how the character works like that and doesn't get enough credit from people as one of the better MCU villains. Layla Alifayuli is the best original character in the entire MCU. She is so cool and i love what they did because she's such a fun character and adds this new perspective and her being mark's wife really is an interesting new thing to add to the moon knight lore and i think it's so cool how they handle her and i love her character and her interactions with mark and steven it has some of the most beautiful shots in the entire mcu it's got really creative filmmaking involved if i had one complaint it's just i wish there was more of that traditional brutal moon knight action but i love everything they're doing on a character wise and this show will always be so special to me i cannot tell you how cool it is that people know who moon knight is now and are excited to see more of him. Number 9, we have Thor Ragnar, the film that pretty much saved the Thor franchise and completely reinvented the character. It is astonishing how they completely turned the franchise on its head and turned Thor into this cosmic space age hero, which was what he should have been from the beginning. It really leans into the Jack Kirby inspiration from the comics. Take Waititi is at his best here with some of the funniest jokes in the entire MCU. It works as a Planet Hulk story, and I think that it's nice that we finally get to dive into the Hulk again after Universal decided not to play ball. His dynamic with Thor has always been really fun to watch. And I think that the film, despite being this wacky comedy, also does a great job of breaking Thor down to his very basics of what Thor is when he loses his identity. He doesn't have his hammer anymore. He's no longer the king of Asgard. He's trying to find his place in the universe. And I think it does a really great job at that and showing that Thor is still the god of thunder without all that and proving he has a place in this universe. This is also where Loki finally gets his redemption arc, which I really appreciate. And it's nice to see this character get. And surely he's going to have a long life and he won't immediately die after in the saddest thing ever. Hela is a fantastic villain. Kate Blanchett is chewing the scenery in the best possible way and it is just a film full of life and color and is exactly the kind of move that the mcu should be striving to make it embraces the comic book roots and modernizes the stories to create a movie that works in the mcu fixes the thor character and is just a joy to watch which is what all these superhero movies should be at the core just a really fun and entertaining movie at number eight, we have Captain America Civil War, a movie that should not work at all. The comic it's based off of is not very good, but the filmmakers were smart enough to take the core idea of that and throw away everything that didn't work and start from the ground up. And turning this film into an interpersonal conflict between Captain America and Iron Man, using the Sokovia Accords to get them against each other, is so smart. It makes sense to introduce them at this point in the MCU to have the Avengers broken up before their biggest challenge, but the real good part of it is that it's just about one mistake Steve made not telling Tony about his parents' death. And that driving Iron Man and Captain America to fight is the best part of this whole movie. They subvert expectations with the super soldiers and Zemo and what the whole movie is about. And it is just a masterclass in, in dramatic storytelling. I love this movie so much. Obviously, you have some of the best action in the entire MCU. The airport scene is still my favorite superhero fight scene ever. It is so much fun to watch. It makes the most of everybody's powers and dynamics and does some really creative action filmmaking. But at its core, what makes this movie work is that it is still a Captain America movie. It revolves entirely around Steve Rogers and how he makes the biggest change he's ever had to do and he turns his back on the government he's aligned himself with for the past two films, and he goes on the run. And it's a really interesting decision and really benefits Steve's character and shows how layered he is where he just wants to do the right thing no matter who it upsets. And I think that's great. And it is why this will always be one of my favorite Marvel films. Oh yeah, by the way, Team Cap for life. I don't understand why you'd be Team Iron Man. Not to bring this up in the year of 2024, but Captain America was right about the Accords. He's wrong about lying to Tony, but he was right about the Accords. So Team Cap for life. At number seven, we have The Avengers, which is still a really surreal movie. I remember sitting in the theater, just kind of amazed that all the Avengers were assembling it from my very eyes. It's one of the most ambitious movies of all time. I can't believe it exists. I'm so happy it does. Even if it was directed by nobody, isn't that crazy? There's just nobody directed. It just appeared one day. That's wild. But it nails the team dynamic and the interaction between all the characters. They all feel real and authentic. And the way they interact with each other and how they don't want to be a team at first. But it's Coulson's death that unites them and gives them something to avenge, which is really smart. It does a lot of foreshadowing shadowing and setup for the future. This has been like the pinpoint moment where the MCU changed forever and for the better, where the characters are now allowed to interact and the world has expanded beyond these grounded events into we're going to space. There's Infinity Stones here with the Tesseract and the Mind Stone. Loki's a phenomenal villain. This is where he really steps up to be like the most popular villain in the MCU with how they handle him. I really do think this is a perfect movie. It's so nostalgic for me already. I rewatch it a lot. I have a lot of good memories watching this with my dad. That really means a lot to me how we kind of have this bond over this movie because 
he grew up reading comics and I grew up watching these shows and movies and then it all culminates in this event that we can both kind of appreciate and that's always going to be really special to me. Number six is Captain America the Winter Soldier which will always be my favorite Captain America movie. This film really helped me fall in love with the character Steve Rogers and showed me just how interesting he can be. Putting Captain America in the modern world shows audiences how this character can work in an updated setting. In how he adapts to the modern world and technology and how things have changed in this surveillance state that S.H.I.E.L.D. slash Hydra is trying to set up or he's vehemently against that because it is taking away people's freedoms and I think that's interesting how Captain America doesn't embody America as it is but he's more of an argument of what America is supposed to be with these perfect morals and he represents all things that are good so when he sees the country doing things that are bad it's some great commentary on what we should be and what strive to be and the way that Steve rejects the government even before the Hydra reveal I think is really fascinating because the Hydra reveal makes it easier for him to take them out but Steve having to face this organization that he's dedicated his life to at this point it creates this moral dilemma within him that makes him really a fascinating of a character and I love his dynamic with Black Widow in this movie I think it's a great idea to pair them together because she represents what he is against in this movie where she is a dedicated spy she's had to kill murder lie do all these horrible things to uphold the truth where he just thinks you should be doing things the right way and they're kind of butting heads in the movie all the way until Natasha realizes everything she's been fighting for has been a lie and joins up with Steve's cause it's just so good then of course you have the titular Winter Soldier Sebastian Stan is killing it with very few lines in this movie but he just has such an aura to him to where you hear that chilling score when he enters the scene where he's got this cool look and seeing Steve have to react to his past haunting him in an evil way and I love that final fight where he just gives up he doesn't want to fight his friend anymore because Steve Rogers always believes in people he sees the good in everyone so even when Bucky his best friend is trying to kill him and doing all these horrible things to the Winter Soldier Steve is going out of his way to find the good in him which is why he brings Sam on board in the movie which I think is a great thing because he sees that Sam is a good man he knows what Sam has to offer and I think that's great this movie is always gonna mean a lot to me it has some of the best action in the MCU I love the spy thriller vibe it goes for it's a phenomenal film and really makes me appreciate Steve Rogers as my favorite character of all time this is where things get serious with number five Loki, the Disney Plus series that I don't think they're ever going to be able to top. It is just spectacular from start to finish. It uses the six episode format better than any series where each episode is building on top of the other until it creates this fantastic arc at the end. Season one on its own is already a masterpiece. I love that first season. I think it's great what it does with the mystery of the Time Variance Authority as Loki is trying to find out who's at the top because he can sense the corruption in it after meeting Sylvie and realizing what they've done to her and then the reveal of He Who Remains is just fantastic. But the second season is really where it's solidified this top five placement for me. The second season is even better in every way. The score is somehow better. The visuals are breathtaking. The direction from Justin Metzen and Aaron Moorhead is phenomenal. It is genuinely might be the best shot Marvel Studios project. It is so pretty to look at. And I love how simple the premise of the season is, where it's entirely about trying to stop the time loom from exploding and ruining time as we know it. It adds such an interesting element because it lowers the stakes from the universe's ending to now just, this bomb is going to go off. We need to stop it. And I like that he fails because they do everything Everything right but of course there'd be a fail safe in there because Kang is smart he's not just gonna let them destroy time as we know it he loses his entire empire that he built and I love how Loki has to look at himself and become the god of stories bring his character arc full circle burdening himself with glorious purpose as he takes his rightful throne at the end of time making the ultimate sacrifice so everybody else in the multiverse can thrive it is a beautiful ending it's the best Marvel finale those shots of Loki ascending to the throne have stuck in my head every single day since I watched it when I'm editing all of my videos I always put the Loki soundtrack on in the back background because it's so soothing and I love that sci-fi aspect to it. Tom Hiddleston's casting as Loki is one of the best things to ever happen to the comic book medium in general. He brings so much life and energy to everything he does and I'm so grateful that we have him in this role. It's just a fantastic series and I don't know if Marvel's ever going to be able to top it. At number four is Spider-Man No Way Home, a film that I really don't have to introduce. We all know why it's good. It's so surreal seeing all three Spider-Man together on the big screen but even outside of that I think it works on its own as a Spider-Man story where it's mostly just a love letter to the character and the live action versions that we've had as they all come together and prop up Tom's Spider-Man showing why he's the best of all of them. Tom Holland gets to do the best acting of his career in this movie. It is amazing the stuff he gets to do. He's able to pull off the joyful, whimsical aspect of Spider-Man and immediately take on this hard burden of responsibility after May dies and you see that vengeful rage inside of him. It's so good. And then with the other Spider-Man, I love the payoff to Andrew where he gets to finally correct the mistake he's been thinking about all this time and save Tom's MJ. That's just so satisfying 
satisfying. I cry every time I watch that scene. It is beautiful. As a massive Spider-Man fan, I appreciate this movie with for everything it does. I've watched it countless times. It is a movie that we're never going to get again. This is a once-in-a-lifetime event that really puts Spider-Man as a character center stage and brings all fans together as they can see these three interacting. And I'm really glad it exists because if you told me we'd see this one day, I would never believe you. It's amazing that a movie with as much chaos as it had behind the scenes can be this good and is a true masterpiece that shows how great of a character Spider-Man is. It completes Tom's origin trilogy and sets him up to be the Spider-Man we all know and love by the end in that fantastic scene with the best Spider-Man suit in live action. Don't forget it. That final swing suit is perfect, just like this movie. It is a masterpiece and I'm so grateful that all the chaos behind the scenes allowed us to get something this good that appreciates the character of Spider-Man and what makes him so spectacular. Number three is fittingly Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I have never cried more watching a movie. I cannot get through this without crying. This movie is beautiful and tragic and heartbreaking and fun and everything you could ever want in a movie is inside of this film. James Gunn put everything he had into this. It's obviously a send-off for these characters, and it does it in such an emotional way. I love that none of them die. You don't have to kill off characters for them to have a satisfying ending, and I like that they all get a happy ending of sorts, and they get to go onto this new journey where we can see them in the future if we want, but if not, we get closure with them. And especially Rocket's arc in this movie, it's hard to watch at times, but it is a necessary story, and I'm very glad Gunn got to come back and tell this, because Rocket immediately became one of my favorite MCs you characters. He's by far my favorite guardian. I'm getting choked up just thinking about this because I just love that little fuzzy guy so much. And the story they tell with him is phenomenal. I cannot believe that he managed to get me to cry so many times about an anthropomorphic talking raccoon. Bradley Cooper's performance as him is amazing. It's, he's an unsung hero in these films and I really wish he could get nominated for something because he's that good. It works so well as a goodbye to these characters that we've grown up with for the better part of a decade. These ragtag misfits who were projected to be Marvel's first flop and have now become in my opinion, this is the greatest trilogy of all time, and this finale is better than any of the other Guardians movies. I love what it does for the team. I love all the dynamics. I love the soundtrack. I know I said Volume 2 was my favorite a few minutes ago, but I'm changing my mind. This one is my favorite. I've become obsessed with it. My Spotify rap last year was entirely this soundtrack because I listened to it way too much. It's been less than a year since it came out, and I've probably watched it five times already, and I'm going to watch it more. I'm going to watch it after I finish this, I think. It's one of the best movies I've ever seen. I love this movie so much, and even though it hurts to watch, I will happily go through this pain any day when the movie is this good. It's a masterpiece of a film and the perfect send-off for these great characters. At number two is my all-time favorite TV show, Daredevil. If you've seen my other video, you know that I'm a huge Daredevil fan, and this show helped me fall in love with the character. I wasn't really familiar with who he is at first, but upon watching it, I knew right away that this character was going to be everything to me. I have watched this more than anything else. I have seen this so many times. I have most of it memorized. Season 3 especially is the best season of TV ever. I will always defend that point. It is so well written as Matt struggles with being depressed and not knowing his place in the world after he feels that he let God down. And the way everything culminates with Fisk's return, Bullseye being in introduced it's such a masterpiece of a season i love it so much you're just gonna hear me gushing about this for however long i decide to talk because daredevil means a lot to me this character i've read so many comics of but this will always be my favorite take on daredevil charlie cox's performance as matt murdoch is out of this world his subtle expressions as a blind man come off as so realistic he puts everything he has in this and he is always gonna be the best daredevil he's irreplaceable one of the best comic book casting choices of all time i'm so excited that he's back along with foggy and karen who are the heart of this series daredevil would not be as good as it is is without them because they bring so much of the human element and ground Matt as a character and obviously Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin is maybe the best villain of all time he's so terrifying he gives such great monologue and strikes fear into everybody he's just a force of nature and an absolute beast and don't even get me started on the cinematography of this show there is no better show movie anything that looks better than this it'll be the most casual shot ever of just two people talking and it'll be dripped in this gorgeous neon lighting and I love it so much I cannot stop talking about this so I'm gonna stop myself now because I'll just go on for an hour. I love Daredevil. It is my favorite show of all time. It always will be. And I cannot wait to see what they do in Born Again. And if it's even half as good as this, we are in for a treat. At number one, if you've done the math, you could probably see this coming, is Avengers Infinity War, my all-time favorite movie. I love this film so much. It is an unforgettable theater experience, just sitting there watching the credits roll after everybody died, stunned in silence, just looking over at my friends, trying to figure out what just happened. This movie, I've watched more than any other film. It is a masterpiece. It is perfect. I love everything about it. The way 
that the Avengers are broken up and still trying to stop Thanos in any way they can, but he's inevitable. You cannot stop what is already coming. They're doomed from the start. The start of the film also sets the tone perfectly, with Thanos not only coming in and killing the villain from the first Avengers movie like it's nothing, but then he beats the Hulk in a hand-to-hand -hand fight without using any stones. Like, that is so impressive, and really shows how terrifying Thanos is going to be as a villain. It's really exciting seeing the Guardians and the Avengers interact in space while on the ground you have Steve Rogers coming out of hiding and getting Nomad Steve in this movie. I've already talked enough about how much I love Steve Rogers, but this is my favorite version of Captain America when he is on his own. He's turned his back on the country that abandoned him, and I love this version of the character. Even if he's in there for seven minutes, he steals the entire movie for me. And of course, Josh Brolin as Thanos is one of the all-time greatest villains. He is so convincing as this big purple CGI monster who just likes to collect rocks, and you feel like he's a real person because of how good that CGI is and how authentic the character is. It is the perfect balance of comedy and crushing, depressing sadness, and obviously the most important part of the film is that ending with Thanos succeeding and snapping. Nobody saw this coming. It is just so well handled because it comes out of nowhere, and up to this point, no villain has ever won in the way that Thanos has, where he succeeds in wiping out half of all life in the universe. We're left in this confused state, no clue what's going on, just knowing that they lost and he won. With that final shot of him staring off at the sunrise at a grateful universe, it is chilling. And then we're stuck with a cliffhanger for a year, which is one of the boldest moves they've ever done. I love how much play Thor gets in this after Ragnarok completely reinvented him. He's almost the main character of this movie, while you have characters like Captain America, Black Widow, Falcon, War Machine, all with Black Panther on Earth, and you have the Guardians with Iron Man, Spider-Man, and Doctor Strange in space. Thor basically gets his own character arc as he goes to get Stormbreaker on a weapon he can actually kill Thanos with. It's really nice to see him step up in this movie. This is my favorite version of Thor as well. He is so compelling, and you really get to see how much he's lost, because he's been through more tragedies than any other character. He's been alive for thousands of years, and he just keeps getting tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy piled up on him. And now with Loki's death at the start of the movie, it is so heartbreaking for him to just try and press on, because that's all he knows. This movie should not be as good as it is. It is a miracle that exists and is this good. I'm always going to love it. I rewatch it every year. Like I said, it's my favorite movie of all time. It is everything to me. I know it beat for beat by memory. It is the peak of Marvel for me. I hope they can do something better than it. They've come very close, but this movie will always have a special place in my heart as the best. And there we have it. All 50 Marvel Studios projects can into the MCU ranked in an order that'll definitely change the moment I publish this. But who knows, maybe in a few years from now, I'll come back to this and do it again when there's more projects to add on. But for now, this is how everything ranks for me. How did I do? Is this bad? I know I have a lot of unique MCU opinions in there. Am I about to get cooked for this? Just let me know what your top five MCU projects are in the comments below. I'm really interested to see what everyone else thinks since there's so much variety out there. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe. Thank you all for watching. Now, please don't hurt me for what I said. I'm begging. Just pretend you didn't see this video. Just spare me, alright?